Welcome to the last lightning talk session today on Saturday afternoon. We will have four talks in this session. And I would like to announce the first talk by someone from Development Seed about OSM Teams. I'm Lane Goodman. I'm a designer at Development Seed, uh, a software consultancy that works with a lot of different partners with a lot of different um, OSM and global Earth observation and map data challenges. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about OSM Teams, a project we've been working on for the past three, three and a half years. Um, the OSM team uh, site or platform can be found at mapping.team. And first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project's background, then I'll tell you about uh, current features and where we're going next. So my colleague Mark Farah announced Teams at State of the Map 2019. Um, the global version in Heidelberg and the U.S. Uh, version in Minneapolis in a lightning talk. You can check out uh, his talks at these URLs. Um, and why OSM Teams? So OSM Teams exists for addressing a few different challenges that we think a lot of different groups face in OpenStreetMap. Um, OSM is a decentralized network of mappers. Um, you could even call it a decentralized social network of mappers. It's also an ecosystem of disconnected applications, lots of third-party applications using different data sources about mappers, about the map data that they're producing, all feeding into the integrated centralized place of OSM itself, but with all these peripherals. Um, and our partners who we work with in the mapping space, NGO space, government space, um, think that it's really important to track the contributions from their groups of mappers. Um, of course, we have the organized edit policy uh, but that doesn't dictate any type of um, uh, tracking or um, centralized place of, of looking at people's contributions. So OSM Teams presents a few different solutions that we think would be really useful for anyone who's using an organized mapping team. Um, it's a centralized database of a group of user IDs on OSM. Um, that's the essential uh, of the API. We see it as like an API glue that's connecting many different applications. Um, it's portable in that you can bring those teams into any of your third-party applications, be that Tasking Manager, OSM CHA, um, Map Roulette. Um, as long as there's an integration built, uh, we can bring in those teams and have those contributions tracked, um, synchronize those teams across those different applications, um, and keep that data contained in its own um, accessible application um, that's not then polluting the, the actual map data itself. Uh, who can use Teams? Anyone. Anyone using an organized uh, editing group, um, whether that's uh, a large corporation or a small uh, charter group. Um, one case study, um, which is the, the main use case thus far of OSM Teams, is Youth Mappers. So Youth Mappers has a massive network of um, mappers who are doing a ton of work on OSM. Um, and thus far, they've created 226 teams. Uh, which are the chapters of Youth Mappers uh, with 500 members in those teams. Um, and so this is replacing um, a ton of manual work where uh, Jennings, the coordinator of this work, uh, was tracking spreadsheets on spreadsheets of teams and their user IDs and trying to track down who was doing what uh, in all of the third-party applications. Um, so OSM Teams is acting as that glue. Um, and we'd really encourage anyone who's doing similar activities uh, to try OSM Teams out. Um, some enhancements that we've added in this past year uh, is the creation of organizations, so you can have teams of teams. Um, you can have user profiles, so attaching additional attributes to those users, um, things like uh, your actual user location or uh, anything that's specific that uh, an organization or team wants to track about its users. Um, and we also have invite links to allow users to join um, from a more directed level from the uh, team admin. Um, we're also working on badges to allow users to show off certain attributes or stats. Uh, what's next? Integrations with other applications, lots of UX UI improvements, um, some backend and, and DevOps upgrades, um, and integrations with uh, apps like I mentioned OSM Cha and Task Manager and your application, if you have one, uh, that you'd like to use Teams in. Um, we'd invite you to check out the docs. Uh, they're on GitHub. Um, you can reach us at Twitter, at Development Seed. Um, my colleague Vitors, who is here, has been an active developer on the project. And like I mentioned, I'm a designer at DevSeed and happy to chat more about it. So thanks very much.
Thank you for the talk. The next talk is about the bike data board check collecting cycle GPS data in an open data way. Ben, the stage is yours. I'm Ben, I'm from Belgium, uh, and I'm, I'm part of OpenStreetMap Belgium, and we're also part of Open Knowledge Belgium, and there we start this project called the Bike Data Project. So um, there already exists a lot of data about cars, uh, GPS tracks, uh, traces, all this data has been collected. It, this already exists, but for bicycles, um, there are a lot of people riding on their bike, but it's not reflected in any data set that currently exists, or not at least um, decent data sets that are widely enough available. So we wanted to solve this problem, and the, the project originally came from a Swedish uh, filmmaker. Um, this is the, his documentary on Netflix, um, and people saw this movie and they started to contribute to the project. Um, once the documentary was made, the project uh, sort of um, uh, fizzled out, and we, as Op Open Knowledge Belgium, started the project. We rebooted it again and, um, and yeah, made it into a sort of open data project because the people contributing the data, um, nothing was really being done with this data. So how does it work? Um, so we try to collect data from different apps. So you see here um, uh, Strava, you see um, you can upload Garmin traces or GPX traces directly. Uh, we can also link in other apps if you have your own app um, tracking bicycle data, you can add them too, and everything ends up in one database. Um, so how does this work? Um, for example, for Strava, uh, which is definitely the most popular uh, way to do it, so you go to the Bike Data Project website, you link your account, and uh, your data gets synchronized once, but also your future rights will get synchronized to this data set. Um, Publication, this is less interesting, but we have some uh, heat map service. We have some statistics that we publish, uh, but we also try to do map matching um, to, to publish the results of this. Uh, we won't publish the raw GPS data at the moment, so uh, this is all uh, going through some form of anonymization. It's, of course, never 100% anonymized, but um, you shouldn't be able to identify individuals anymore. So this is one of the results. So this is Belgium that you see here. Already quite a lot of data. And I have to be honest, the heat map looks fuller than the actual data. So, but there is quite a lot. So I, I invite you to go to the website and have a look. Um, so, and there, there, we really need help. So basically at the moment, it's just me doing this project and I think it's really important. So I want to invite everyone to come and contribute um, to this project. So help us um, develop and maintain these tools. Are we also looking for funding and partners to further the project? Um, so please, if you have some leads or some um, people who want to contribute, um, you're very welcome. So what can you help with? So we have the website, we have the data portal, we have an API that you can help with. Um, and yeah, so these are all, all things you could be doing, so um, you're welcome to do so. Um, one of the ideas is to link OpenStreetMap, where you can also upload GPS traces to this project. Um, we can also provide uh, users um, the option to opt out of the anonymization that we can publish the raw GPS tracks just uh, the way that is being done now on osm.org. Um, and yeah, of course, link more apps uh, to more about the data processing and stuff like that. So what's in it for you? Um, <clears throat> you gain experience with the real world project. Um, you help cyclists and cycling communities around the world put them on the map and maybe make some new friends. So. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for the talk. The next talk is, a, is from Joost Schuppe from OSM Belgium, about 360 degree imagery everywhere worldwide. Joost, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, so, hello, I'm Joost. I'm from OpenStreetMap Belgium. Um, I'm not a graphic designer, as you will see in my slides. Um, I'm, I'm here to talk uh, to you about a very small project. Um, so, the lightning uh, talk format is perfect. Um, we're uh, working on uh, 360 degree imagery um, 
uh, trying to get coverage for the whole country eventually. Um, now, we, we started this project because we had two problems. Uh, problem number one is everyone and their dog is buying access to street level imagery in uh, Flanders, um, the northern part of the country, um, but they don't buy the actual images. So the images get sold and sold and sold, and we, as, a, uh, as the rest of the population, don't have access. Um, we tried lobbying them, we tried to convince them to do things differently, and we failed. Um, so there's a problem number two, which is the best problem ever to have, is that we had some money to spend. Uh, so we have a corporate membership, and now we have some money. So we, we, we had to do something with the money. Um, and so we tried, uh, we, we thought maybe we can lead by example. Uh, maybe if we show people um, how um, easy and cheap it can be to collect your own imagery, uh, other people will start following that example. Um, so it, it took us uh, a while to find a way to do this, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this very brief talk. Um, is, um, so first of all, we decided, uh, we, we did some research to see which camera is fit for purpose. Um, and after some research, we went for the, the GoPro Max 360-degree uh, cameras, which are incredibly easy to use. Um, they work great on bicycles, which happen to be the, uh, the transport that most of our volunteers are using. Uh, they also work on a, on a helmet on, a, on, uh, on foot, which looks a little silly. Um, and you can put them on a car as well quite easily. Um, we went for 360 as well because of the immersiveness. Uh, we, we noticed that for people who are used to having really high quality uh, street level imagery available, um, just having the flat images that you have from a, a regular GoPro or a smartphone simply doesn't cut the bill. Um, so uh, then we started uh, looking for volunteers to, uh, to use these things. Uh, so we asked for people to have uh, to come up with a kind of mission. What what, what will you do? Um, so one example: someone is going to hike an entire uh, long distance hiking trail with a helmet camera. Um, uh, but other people. Um, so for example, we had a cycling activist he, who mapped this whole village um, to be able to show where all the the local issues are. Um, a really cool thing about that is that this 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 project is functioning uh, by, by by chance basically um, as a seeding project. So um, this guy, this uh, cycling activist, um, uh, managed to get a grant to buy further cameras. Uh, so the the uh, the cameras are multiplying. Um, we bought three ourselves, and he has a budget of ten thousand now to to spend on uh, stuff related to this. Um, also, someone in a tourism organization landed uh, a camera, and uh, after he showed his colleagues the results and how practical, uh, practical uh, the imagery is for their own work, uh, they decided to buy their own camera as well. Um, and then uh, another very interesting volunteer is a, a mobility planner uh, who works for mun municipalities to, uh, to make very detailed plans on uh, how they should uh, change uh, mobility in, in, uh, on, the, on the local level. Um, and for him, it's very practical to uh, do a before and after shoot uh, so that you can really see uh, where the difficult places are and, and how things look afterwards. Um, so he's doing several municipalities, um, and I hope one day we'll upload his own images because I'm still supporting that. Um, so um, uh, right now, we only publish them on Mapillary because it's so practical, um, but we're also building an offline archive, and the idea is that if there's other uh, users who want to do something with the images, that we can provide them. Um, uh, that's about it, I guess. Uh, so we've been uh, on this since March of this year, and uh, the blue stuff is, the, is uh, what we managed to do with, uh, with the project, which I think for the time that we're working on this is uh, pretty is, is okay. Thanks. Thank you, Joost, for your talk. The next talk is by Albert Bautista from Meta about administrative boundaries. Albert, the stage is yours. Hi, everyone. My name is Albert Bautista. I'm a Polygon project manager at Meta. And I want to talk today about the World Administrative Boundaries Dataset Project that I'm, I'm currently working on. As I start, I wanted to present my agenda. We'll talk about the background, some of the challenges and issues that I face with this project, and a call to action I hope that everyone can join in. So just some background of who I am. As I mentioned, I'm a Polygon project manager. I do a lot of polygonal data partnerships and support a lot of um, 
<clears throat> internal and external usage of uh, open data here at Meta, but also outside in our community. And one of the big things too that I support is the Meta app uh, open data initiative and tooling, uh, the daylight map distribution, Mapillary, Rapid, and Map with AI. If you are interested in more about this, we have a birds with a feather coming up. Um, so definitely do check that out. It'll be a great opportunity to learn more about them. But at the heart of the work that I do is polygonal data that includes geo geopolitical administrative data, borders, and disputed areas. With that, it comes with a lot of challenges working on this type of data. I have seen a lot of challenges in terms of inconsistency, inconsistencies and mixed resolution. You could see here where in, in some parts of OSM, you could see the differences between an authoritative data set and as well as OSM, and it doesn't match. Uh, in some cases, even the resolution is bad. Um, we have very low resolution in some areas. It's very mixed, and it's, what, it's quite unfortunate. In terms of uh, geometry, we also have issues in terms of gaps, inconsistencies, precision. We have topological issues and errors that would cause a lot of issues in our pipelines, but as well as our usage when we're trying to process this data. And this is evident in, in all of our um, administrative boundaries data sets. Even more so, it's so challenging to find access and sourcing of these administrative boundary data sets. You could find almost any, um, you could find it in any other um, open data sets, but they could be either incomplete or the governmental data set or the authoritative data set is not open to giving them all. You really have to sort them out. So there's really no access and it's a really complicated problem. Even to add all to that, geopolitical disputes is another problem. We have different viewerships towards what the world will look like for, for different countries. And we have different viewerships in terms of how we consider who owns this and who owns that. So these challenges are a lot for the work that I do. And honestly, I need help. <laughs> so one of the biggest things that I want to do is to call action from the community and strategize and unify our efforts to support and standardize, standardizing administrative and polygonal data sets worldwide. I want to use this uh, community to, to essentially to unify all of our, um, our strengths and our skills to develop a better data set that is more accessible, um, readily available, and more accurate. And even more so, I want to utilize it in a, an environment that is quality controlled and readily available through our daylight map distribution. And if you are interested in more about what daylight is, you could use the QR code and scan and see what daylight is all about. It's a great, uh, it's a great distribution. And I would love everyone to check that out. With that, I really want to take this opportunity for us to collaborate and really look at administrative boundaries data sets and really get all the opportunities from not only from the community, but as well as corporations. So I do implore you to add me up. I have another QR code. Look at that cat. So please help me out with administrative boundaries. It'll be a great opportunity to, to join in. Thank you. Thank you, Albert, for your talk.